During the High Renaissance in Italy, only two artists were ever given the honorary title of Il Divino, or the Divine. One was the famed artist Michelangelo, painter of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The other, who is less famous today but was just as highly revered as Michelangelo during his lifetime, was a lute player named Francesco de Milano. Hi, my name is Cameron Welke, I'm a lute player, and I'm here to give you a very brief history of the lute. The lute was the single most important instrument of the Renaissance. Lute players were some of the most highly sought after artists of their day, and in the 16th century, there was over twice as much music published just for the lute as for all other instruments combined. The European lute originated from the Middle Eastern oud, and underwent many changes until it eventually fell out of fashion around the time of the French Revolution. Lutes from the High Renaissance look something like this. Characteristic features are the double stringing, like you would see on a mandolin, uh, the bowl-shaped back, uh, and a neck that bends back at roughly a right angle. Lutes are made almost entirely of wood. The flat sounding board on the front is generally made of something like spruce. Uh, yew and fruit woods are fairly common for the bowls on the back, uh, and generally harder woods, like ebony, are what you're going to find on the fingerboard and on the neck. Lute strings were originally made with catgut, which is short for cattle gut. No cats were harmed in the making of lute strings. This material is used less often today because of how incredibly sensitive it is to changes in humidity and temperature, uh, but it does have a uniquely warm and richly textured sound to it. As time passed, players looked for ways to expand the lute's low end to give it more punch when playing with singers or other instrumentalists. This eventually led to the development of the arch lute and the chitarrone, or more commonly today, the theorbo. These instruments were developed around the 1700s and are lute bodies, but with these long neck extensions with harp-like bass strings that can extend as long as six or seven feet. These bass strings added a weight and depth of sound that made these supersized lutes the preferred instruments for accompanying singers, particularly in opera. The last flourishing of the lute was during the lifetime of J.S. Bach. Many lutes of this time looked similar to earlier lutes, but had much thicker necks due to the addition of more bass strings. The arch lute idea was eventually applied to these later lutes to create the swan-necked or theorboed lute. These lutes didn't have neck extensions nearly as long as arch lutes or theorbos, but did have small neck extensions that allowed for the use of longer and thicker bass strings.
faded from use around the time of the French Revolution for a myriad of reasons. Some of the chief among these were the increasing in complexities of the instrument itself, as well as the decline of court culture, which had been a lot of what supported the instrument and the people that played it for so long. It wasn't until the mid-20th century that players and audiences alike began to fall back in love with the sound of the lute, thanks to the work of the folks involved in the early music revival. Nowadays, we're lucky to have a strong community of lute makers who build all sorts of lutes based on historical models, uh, as well as a strong community of players, like me, who are really deeply invested in exploring historical performance practice on the lute. We may not be on every street corner or in every concert hall, but if you look hard enough, there's a good chance that you can find someone playing the lute near you. I hope you've enjoyed this very brief history of the lute. Uh, thank you very much to the people at Agecroft for helping make this video happen. Thanks to you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.